running a few minutes late, but he's going to be here very shortly. So, um, introductions. Sure. I'm Caitlin Steele, the Director of Teaching and Learning for the District. I'm Vicki Wells, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. Josh Quinn, the Business Manager. Harry Hansen. Nick Colston, ACSD Board. Lorraine Morris, ACSD Board. Uh oh. Peter Burrows, Superintendent. Suzanne Buck, member. Jen Newseater, ACSD Board. Chip Malcolm, same. <laughs> Bruce Hardy, same. <laughs> I can't thank you either. Everyone for showing up and thanks people in the audience for coming tonight. Um, Excuse me, Lorraine. Um, I'm not able to get on the internet, so. I can help with that. Yeah, okay. Do you want to have people? Yeah, I was going to say, um, the people in the audience like to introduce themselves as well. Why don't you, we can wait for you to finish whatever you're eating. <laughs> 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 Come on, Josh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fernanda Canal is principal of Salisbury Community School. Yeah. Yeah. Christina Johnston, principal of Avery Elementary School. Is there enough time? Oh. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> John Flowers, Addison Independent. Meg Baker, a uh, community member. I'm also the Addison County Pre-K coordinator. Um, Ace Baker Ross, um, son. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Fuentes, George, community member. Natasha Ngaiza, community member. Mike Lennox, Shore Mill, Metro School principal. Uh, Leah Henry Bochamp, I am a parent and I am an educator. Thanks. Karen Lefko, community member. Nikki Dobrevo, community member. Mark Stefani, community member, parenting. Uh, Sophia Stefani. <laughs> and before I forget, help yourself to zucchini bread with nuts, so if you're allergic, don't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this time, we generally take public comments. I'm assuming some of you at least might be interested in speaking. So, Wait, Lorraine, can we do oh, the agenda? Oh, yes, first? we did not. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, if you wanted to. Add something to the agenda? Well, I, w I wanted to add, first of all, we need to approve bills at right. some point in the agenda, yes. so wherever you want to add that, um, we should do that. Yes. And then the second thing is the agenda item, which um, is titled, um, it's under the report of the board, board response to national events. I w would like to request that the board move it up to the beginning of the agenda. Um, many of the community members here are here to speak to that and many of them have small children and so I wanted to see if we could accommodate that and I could um, move a proposed uh, resolution and then we could discuss it and the co comments could come at that time. Um, <coughs> this is an item on the agenda. Okay, I would like to uh, approve the finance and the minutes before we start that because I know Peter is planning to be here any minute and I'm sure he wants to be here for the the comments and the discussion of this. So, uh, but, uh, we have a recommendation to approve the minutes of June 19th. So moved. Second. Are there any uh, corrections to the minutes? Okay. Hearing none, um, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, they're approved. Uh, bills, who's going to report this out, Ruth? I will. Um, so um, the Finance Committee started um, signing bills because we are now overseeing the finances of our new school district. And the Finance Committee consists of uh, Nick Costin, Steve Orzek, who's not here, and myself. Um, but we have had some people helping us, which is really great. Um, Victoria signed bills uh, two weeks. Um, Peter Conlin signed bills one week and Suzanne Buck signed bills one week so um, and Mary has signed up to do it if there's anybody else Chip has mentioned that he would be willing to help if you even can take a week or two that would be great um, but our general fund for 717 July 17th is one one thousand five hundred and seventeen dollars and seventy cents that was our very first <laughs> bills <laughs> On 724 is $83,671.30. On July 31st, 
$34,773.83 on, um, sorry, they're a little out of order. Um, on uh, August 7th, $42,158. On August 14th, $42,615.81. It's remarkably close to the previous week. And on today is seven, $276,793.06. So they're being looked at weekly, but how are they being? The they're being um, signed weekly. Um, two board members are going in to review the bills. Generally, we've been doing it together, but we won't always be doing it together. And. Um, Josh has developed new procedures that we have actually written procedures <laughs> and um, for signing the bills, a new stamp, double signature, um, and uh, just uh, following the policies that the Finance Committee is actually still working on that the Board hasn't approved yet but that are in, in process. So, so we see all the bills? I mean, it's not like certain <coughs> schools are being done certain Correct. Things. See them all. They're all together. They're all mixed, yep. mixed together. Yep. Enough that order of the vendor. Yeah, so it's been it's been really interesting to see them all together and and also trying to get on the same process for everybody for every school. Josh is working hard with all the people who are doing bills, um, and even in the five weeks we've been doing it, we've seen progress and getting on the same page, which is really nice. So, um, so I. Wait, did we have a motion to, uh, if no, so, uh, I will make the motion to approve the bills. Second. Well, second. Uh, all in favor of approving the bills as read by Ruth? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you guys for doing that. I know that's not a fun task. It's been really interesting, actually. Well, it's, interesting. <laughs> it's, really it's fun for me. <laughs> well, that's good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. So, uh, and here comes our chair, Peter Palmer. Carry, carry on, please. Well, Ruth had asked that we move the um, discussion of the uh, board response to national events up to the front with uh, the comments from the audience. Sure. So, we also have Chris Eaton, board member who just joined us by phone. You there, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Hello. So if we're on um, this. Have we gotten into this conversation yet? No. And Mary Gill, you didn't get to introduce yourself. Mary Gill from Middlebury. So I'm Peter Conlon, and I'm the, the chair since I missed introductions, and I'm getting myself organized, and we'll continue on. Um, so that we're going to move this up. We're moving. Yeah, it. is that okay? Sure. We just have yep. a lot of um, community a lot of folks members here, who here don't and have kids. And yep. So, uh, as everybody knows, this is a time, um, really, for the um, the board to listen. We generally don't enter into debates when we have one of these. It's really our time to just hear from you, digest what you have to say. But if if you don't mind, people might have some clarifying questions as we go along, just to ask you a little bit more about your experiences. Yep. Do you mind if I introduce, because I oh, no, invited please. everybody, yes, so I, absolutely. I want, don't want them to feel on the spot, yeah. and so um, I want to just make the motion for the resolution, and then we can have it on the floor to discuss. Is that an okay uh, procedure? Or uh, no? let's, do, let's do the public comment part okay, first. Okay, okay. So um, just as an introduction, um, as, I, I mean, I sent this out. I have a few paper copies, if anybody in the audience wants a paper copy of the thing that I sent out. Um, I'll just stick them here and you can grab them if you want them. Um, but um, after the incident uh, of the violent Nazi protest in Charlottesville, Virginia, that resulted in one death and lots of injuries, um, where um, Nazi and Confederate regalia were prominently displayed, and uh, the national response from our leader, uh, our quote unquote leader, was really pathetic and offensive. And then simultaneously, we had two Confederate flags flying in East Middlebury. And it was disturbing, and it was um, horrifying and painful for a lot of members of our community. And 
So after a few days of trying to figure out what I could do, I realized, hey, I'm a school board member, and I feel that the school board should have a response to this. And I think that it's long past time that our schools do more to um, prevent racism, bias, and hate in our schools and be a leader in our community to ensure that our community is also um, understanding of these issues and us responding appropriately. Um, so I started calling friends and talking to people, my own neighbors in East Middlebury, um, about the Confederate flags and um, the response. And there was a, a lively Facebook um, discussion about it. And it also reminded me that there had been an incident on our school property a couple of years ago with a Confederate flag being flown by a student on his truck. And so I called the parent who was involved in that, Dr. Leah Beauchamp, and talked to her at length about that. And for those of you who haven't seen it, there's also a student-made video about that incident, um, trying to figure out what we could do as a board. And so I wrote up this document with the background and some recommendations for what we can do. And I want to thank Dr. Beauchamp in particular for her feedback and also um, some of my neighbors in East Middlebury, um, Kemi, Natasha, um, Karen, hi, <laughs> and David, um, and others who I, uh, Meg, who I talked to for feedback on what I was proposing. Um, so that's where I came to. And I reached out to a lot of, um, I, I also spoke to some members of Habara and got some feedback from the Jewish community in our town. Um, and um, just sent a, an invitation uh, and called a lot of people to invite them to be here. So most of the people who are here to speak are here at my invitation. And I just wanted um, you all to know that and that um, uh, they, but I don't know what they're going to say. I just know that they're here to speak on this um, and wanted to, that as an introduction. So go ahead. Oh, no, why don't you go ahead and introduce your, your guests? Oh, uh, well, I mean, you can manage the public comments if you want. I, I don't know who wanted to speak, but go for it, Lena. <laughs> so uh, when you speak with you, stand up, give yeah, us your name, no what town you're from. That would be great. I'm Leah Bochamp. I am the woman that took down the Confederate flag two years ago. Um, Thank you. Oh, there was no problem. Um, and yeah, there was a film made about the incident. And I will have to say that I wrote a letter to Mr. Lawson and I cc'd it to Dr. Burroughs, and the flag was taken down. Um, and so from my perspective, let me take a step back. My kids asked me, what are you doing tonight? And I said, I'm going to the school board meeting. And my son Nicholas said, why? And I said, flag gate has resurfaced. Because when that Confederate, when I took the Confederate flag down, it was, there was a lot of stir and unrest, um, but it was quietly taken care of. And so, you know, Mrs. Hardy called me last week to, I don't know why you called me, how'd you find, she found me. <laughs> you did, she, saw, she sought me out and she asked me. I knew who you were. <laughs> well, she asked me, you know, what I thought, and I will have to say that this is, it was interesting, because I printed out the letters that I wrote to Mr. Lawson and to, uh, actually the kid whose flag I took. Um, and it's dated October 3rd, 2015. And so there's a part of me that is like a little annoyed that two years later we're actually having this discussion when I thought the most, the moment in which we really should have had it when there was an actual incident with a, a Confederate symbol at school, we didn't take advantage of it issues of racism in my perspective and from the past eight years being a parent of two students that attend Addison Central um, schools is that any incident of that deals with racism, um, multiculturalism, um, discrimination is often treated situationally. It's taken care of very quietly. There, I've never had an incident when things have not been resolved, but when we should have been having this discussion was two years ago. Um, with that said, you know, I say I feel strike while the iron's hot, 
But I do want to caution the board, and please, this is with all due respect to Mrs. Harvey. She called me on Sunday. What was it Sunday? I, I called you originally on Wednesday and then Saturday. It was yeah, Saturday. Conversations. And you had said to me, you should become a board member. <laughs> You, this, you're the type of person we need on the ACSD board, and I had told you, with all due respect, that I have 180 days left, and my last child will successfully launch. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and I have a tendency to talk a lot, and I don't think everyone wants to hear what I have to say. And your response to me was, don't worry about that. I'm uppity too. And then it struck me. To use the word uppity in and of itself, the language we use, and I question the board to, to take a good look at themselves about the language that you use while you discuss that. Because in and of that, that statement of you're uppity and I'm uppity, that was racist in itself. And it brought me back to that moment while Rush Limbaugh, he always gets himself in a hole. But he said something to Michelle Obama a couple of years ago about her being uppity in, in, in reference to the NASCAR races. And I said, it, it made me begin to think about that you as all as a board, how, how culturally competent are you all? And the language that we use to talk about these discussions. I also think about, because I think a lot, but I thought a lot about the IB coming. And you know, Ruth had asked me to write a Christmas list, so to speak, about what I thought ACSD could do to create more inclusive and diverse schools and create a dialogue around diversity and inclusion. Um, so I made my Christmas list, and it's in her little printout. Um, but I also wanted to caution the board, too, to really systematically assess the cultural competencies of the teachers that teach in ACSD. I used to work for ACSD. I worked at Bridgeport. And there have been a lot of instances where the wool's been pulled, you know, the rug's been pulled out from under, underneath my feet. But it was last January, a teacher had come to me at Bridgeport. This is a teacher who's been there for 10 years and said, Dr. Beauchamp, we need a guest speaker. And I never want to turn away from a guest speaking engagement. So I said, okay, sure, what am I guest speaking on? And she said, well, we're, I'm about to start a, a, a unit on the Civil War, and I'd like you to come in and be the guest speaker on slavery. And then it was another one of those moments where I, er, I said, why do you want me to come talk about slavery? Well, you know, no, I don't know. Well, you're black. And I said, listen, I have the basic education on the Civil War and slavery as anybody in this building. You know, I do have a PhD in special ed. I can talk about curriculum development, curriculum adaptation. We can talk special ed. But if you want me to come in and be a guest speaker on slavery simply because I'm the only black person in the district, no, I'm not coming. And I went and talked to the principal about it because it bothered me on a systemic level because I thought about if we want our kids to critically think and become critical thinkers um, and become well-versed in dealing with issues of inclusion and diversity, we as educators have to be able to present them with the information and we need to be well-versed um, and be more multiculturally sensitive. And so I spoke to the principal about this at Bridgeport. She was like, oh, she didn't mean it that way. Well, I'm not quite clear to this day, we're now in August, how she meant it. And, you know, it began this discussion at Bridgeport about this kind of thing makes us feel uncomfortable. Just let it go. She didn't mean it. You don't have to go speak in her class. I didn't go speak in her class. And then, in preparation for this meeting, I talked to my son, Nicholas, who's at Williams College. He's about to start his sophomore year. And I talked to my daughter, Olivia, who is going into her senior year. That's why the 180-day countdown is on. We're going to launch successfully. And I asked them, in school, how do you talk about issues of race, ethnicity, diversity, inclusion? And both kids, Nick has, you know, hindsight is 2020, so he may have a clearer vision of it. And Olivia's in the thick of it. She, they both 
told me, we don't. And I said, why? And Olivia said, because it makes people feel uncomfortable. I said, but where, where do you have a forum in which you can talk about issues of inclusion and diversity? And she said, we do that at the kitchen table at Sunday night at dinner. But we don't do that at school because the teachers don't want us to talk about that. And that became very important to me in so much as just coming here tonight and sharing with the board that as we begin and take this dive into the IV pond, that we really start talking about cultural competencies, not only in the board, but in the teaching staff. Because I was just talking to Peter before the meeting about the importance of just the presence of the teacher, that relationship, that dialogue. Teachers make a difference. Um, and I would love to I would love to see you all systematically look at the social competencies of ACSD in order to use that as a springboard for a long needed discussion because I did take the flag and I will do it again if presented with the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ooh, anybody want to go next? Please. I'm KV of Fuentes George, and I'd just like to build off a couple of things that Dr. You can call me Leah, but it's that, Dr. Bojan. That Leah has said. So one is, um, and you know, I've, I've come across this myself several times in dealing with people who have said things that are offensive or problematic without meaning it to be that way. And you know, I do want to say that um, that may happen sometimes, right? Um, that's happened to me with uh, people from the LGBTQ community, for instance, um, you know, growing up in Jamaica, we didn't have a strong movement for LGBTQ rights. So it's something that I had to like learn to respond to when I came to the states. And you know, so I, I am aware that people may have good intentions, but still mess up from time to time. But what I want to stress is that, especially for people who are not necessarily culturally competent, that the proper response should not be to say, okay, well, we didn't mean it that way, you know, let's sweep this under the rug or get over it, the proper response, and I you know, want to make sure that if there's any training that this gets taught, the proper response is not to be defensive, but to be responsive, right? So that if you, if somebody messes up or says something, you know, inappropriate or whatever, even if you didn't mean it to be that way, don't retreat into your defensive shell of, well, I'm a good person, therefore I could not have done something offensive, but rather engage with the person who's been um, who's been offended. Now the second thing that I want to get at, and I've noticed this um, uh, to some extent speaking to my son, uh, who's he's 10 now, he goes to the um, elementary school, um, in the way that, so the way that he has spoken about race, and I've, I've seen this as well with other people who are older who have met when I went to the South, and people from, um, excuse me, from my, um, Graduate, undergraduate education, is that many people um, in, in education and younger and so on have seemed to have taken the approach that um, systematic racism is in the past and we're all equal, right? Especially the second part, we're all equal under the law. I treat everybody fairly, um, you know, because we're, we're more enlightened now, right? And, and everybody's created equal under, you know, God if, if that's, if that's uh, what you believe in and so on. And that does create some problems, I think, in that if people um, uh, discuss uh, racial relations as a matter of equality and saying that we're all equal, uh, what I worry about is that it doesn't explain or doesn't get into the fact that we might be all equal in a human sense, but that doesn't mean we're all going to be treated equally under the system. And I've seen this um, worse in pattern where people say, well, we are all equal, therefore, why are we talking about race still? Why are we talking about oppression? Why are we talking about, um, you know, uh, profiling and so on, right? And, you know, I can tell you firsthand, um, you know, I've been racially profiled here, right? I moved to um, East Middlebury um, uh, to thought like a couple of years ago, um, you know, just moved to the neighborhood, probably a week after we moved in, walked down the road to go to the is the public library, uh, had the police called on me, right? Because I, I fit the description. 
Um, you know, I've been racially profiled in every single state that I've gone to, okay? Uh, Massachusetts, um, Ohio, you know, I, I have like so many stories, right? And I think in, in telling people, especially students at all ages, that we're all equal, the emphasis should, should therefore be, but we're not being treated equally, right? And then the question is, well, so if someone says, you know, um, you know I've experienced, experienced some discrimination and so on, um, again, not to kind of retreat into the, I'm colorblind, I don't even see race kind of thing, right? And then the third point that I wanted to um, uh, talk about as well, in that is that if we say that we don't want to talk about race because we don't want to make people uncomfortable, um, what I want to stress is that if we don't, uh, or, or the way that we engage with race is going to make some people uncomfortable, right? If we sweep it under the rug and don't talk about it and don't engage with, you know, questions about discrimination, the people who are going to be uncomfortable are going to be the people, the, you know, minority students and so on, who experience that, right, and don't feel like they have an outlet, okay? And so while we might, you know, feel, or members of the, you know, dominant class might feel uncomfortable in talking about, well, what does systemic discrimination and so on look like, um, that's, you know, I, I, I do sympathize with that, but I, you know, in my opinion, that's a small price to pay for ensuring that the more vulnerable people um, can feel more comfortable, particularly since they're the ones who are likely to face the burdens of um, not dealing with these issues adequately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, board members, do you have any, uh, sort of any clarifying questions you'd like to ask? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> to make sure other people had a chance to, to speak. Um, I'm Karen Guntag, and I live in East Middlebury, and my daughter uh, is heading into second grade. And I come to this issue from a couple of different perspectives. Um, one is as the single white Jewish mother of a, an adopted biracial Jewish child um, with the hope for her that she will be able to see herself reflected in her curriculum um, and that she will become comfortable with terminology that will help to validate her own experiences and give her the tools to understand the experiences of the rest of her community when they differ from her own. Um, and that's a high goal in a place as white <laughs> as Vermont um, and I take my responsibility very, very seriously and recognize that um, she's not going to have a lot of natural encounters with a diverse community that are going to allow her to learn a lot of these, um, develop a lot of relationships, learn about different cultures and practices and people and develop authentic relationships. And, um, and I think most of our children in this community are going to have very similar experiences. And so I feel like I as a parent and we as a community have to work overtime in the absence of a natural opportunity for um, community influence to ensure that our children are really learning about the range of history and, um, and language to help them navigate um, communities with individuals with different experiences. And I think that that includes in very intentional ways as, as um, um, Kimmy and Dr. Rochamp have, have said, really talking about systems and talking about lenses of identity and dominant identities and underrepresented identities and being able to understand the ways in which we all have our, our pack of cards and our different lenses. Um, and I would like the school system to partner with me in raising my child with this level of competency and raising our, our broader community of children with that level of competency. So I bring that lens as a parent I also bring the lens of being a staff member at Millbury College, um, which, as you are aware, um, is rife with turmoil reflected in um, our own institutional challenges, echoing our national challenges um, of being an institution that um, has a history of being a dominant white institution and is struggling with figuring out how do you diversify um, and uh, a community in ways other than simply bringing numbers. What does it mean to truly have a diverse community that is inclusive and supports the right of all members to thrive? And um, what I see in our students 
is um, generation after generation of students who are um, smart and have tremendous potential and um, have so little competence and so little experience in understanding how to talk about these issues and how to interact with each other that they inflict tremendous damage um, on each other, that they um, miss critical opportunities for growth of the sort that Kami was talking about, being responsive rather than defensive, and that our learning goals as an institution are compromised by um, our students' inability to know the language and to know how to navigate what it means to live in a complex community of diverse individuals. And for an institution that aspires to be globally engaged and graduate students who have a global level of global competency, that's a big problem. And I don't want my daughter to come to college without that competency. I don't want her to perpetrate it, and I don't want her to be influenced by it. And I feel a sense of urgency um, around this, and I'm very um, excited and optimistic about that, about the potential for partnering with the school system, even as I know there's not a silver bullet here. Um, and it seems to me that what we really need to do is um, take advantage of communities and research that is way ahead of us <laughs> uh, on this. I know that um, we are not the first community to wrestle with these kinds of issues, and we're not going to solve it tonight at this meeting. But I would really like to see um, an intentional plan developed with some timelines around how we're going to take advantage of both local and national resources to help us make measurable progress in these areas so that by the time my daughter's down to her 180-day count, uh, <laughs> um, she has a facility with um, understanding her own identity and understanding the identities of others where power and privilege dynamics may vary in her direction and not in her direction and is able to navigate that with some sense of confidence and, and, um, and comfort. And I'd like to be part of that in whatever way I can um, and appreciate um, the space to talk about it. Thank you very much. Christina. Um, Christina Johnston, Principal at Laybridge. Um, I, I want to say that I'm really, really happy that this cut has come before the board. Um, and, and, that, and I also want to say that I hope the action that we take is really thoughtful, that we're not in a react, reactive place and that we think through, because it's very complex in our particular culture to address issues in ways that don't actually reinforce bias. Um, and so, the, and, and again, given the situation that many of us have very little experience ourselves in talking openly and honestly and without fear, that the adults really do need to do, have an opportunity to do work that's well supported and guided before we say we're going to teach the children this. That's almost the worst thing we can do is to go in that direction, potentially look at a program that would help us do this. We have some personal work to do. And I would very much like to take part in it. And I'm really, really glad that the board is entertaining a conversation about this. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, my name is Mark Stefani, and I'm a member of both of the community and of Havara here in the community. And I'd like to say that I very much support um, you know, this, this um, the proposal and the goals of putting together this, you know, a group to try to, um, to examine these issues. Um, I, but I also agree that it has to be done very carefully and very thoughtfully so that we don't, again, provoke a sort of retrenchment of the very attitudes that we're trying to bring together. Um, I very much see um, with the Confederate flags and the other symbols um, the emphasis on racism. Um, and I know that that is a, is a, is a, is a real focus and, and, a, and a legitimate focus. Um, I see that you know anti-Semitism is also on there as well as Islamophobia, etc. And um, you know I, I do want to point out that that at the during the march in Charlottesville, um, that that many of the actual verbalized slogans and the signs were 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 um, explicitly anti-Semitic as well. Um, and so that this is something that we should also address as, as we go through uh, and think about 
the waves, and that the Confederate flag, the, the Confederate battle flag, the stars and bars, is being, there are, there are intentional attempts now to rebrand it as an all-purpose anti-government symbol. So it's, it's, it's even being more broadly put forth for people to use as a sign of, it's essentially anti-anti-government as well. So those are things <coughs> to think about as we go. Thank you. Yes, please. <clears throat> um, my name is Nikki Dobreva. I come from a very international family. I'm a foreign national. We've lived in Vermont for about eight years. My husband, uh, Puerto Rican, American born. Anytime we land at Burlington Airport, they ask him, is this your first time in this country? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I really appreciate this discussion, uh, this effort to incorporate multiculturalism, anti-racism, and all that into our schools. How about we start with Vermont? We're trying to solve national issues here, racial issues, we're not gonna do that. How about we teach our kids that we're all Vermonters? Like, we live here, we work here, my kids were born here. Yeah, I'm still a foreign national, but I'm a Vermonter. Uh, and that's something that's very hard to explain to, yeah, a 95% white state. <laughs> um, so that's just my, you know, idea of how to address this on a local level. And from there, you know, we have to talk about diversity, we have to talk about um, inclusivity and so on, um, but let's start locally. That's just my idea of how to address this, but yeah. You have a good plan going on here. I don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with uh, recruiting people of color. Where <laughs> are you going to find them? I mean, the college has been trying and, you know, it's, it's a hassle. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, you're no, here, saying, but, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to retain people for it. You, know, you don't have hairdressers to do your hair. You don't have food, <laughs> where to buy the food. Uh, like, I have to go to Massachusetts to get some of the food that I eat uh, because it's not available here. So um, just, you know, working towards that is, is hard because the state itself doesn't, is not diverse enough. Uh, but we got to start somewhere. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Natasha, and guys, I have two um, two little girls. In uh, one is six, going into first grade. The other is three. So I don't have a lot of experience in the public schools here. Um, my six-year-old is at Mary Hogan, and so yeah, I don't have a lot. It's just one year of experience um, in Mary Hogan. I will say. Um, I'm really grateful for this. Um, thank you, Ruth, for inviting us and, and for for being willing to talk about this. Um, so there's many many things on my mind. I'll say first that yes, this is very uncomfortable, right? It's it's uncomfortable to talk about race. It's uncomfortable to address racism, and it's not easy. It's just not easy. It won't be easy. Um, and I'll say that it's really, it's really uncomfortable for us too, as people of color. I think, <coughs> may at least I'll speak for myself and for, for my husband, for uh, any color that I know. Um, specifically, addressing a group of white people about racism, there's always uh, a kind of um, having to prepare yourself, having to prepare yourself to be for it to be denied or the usual, well, I'm colorblind, which doesn't make any sense, nobody's colorblind, that's not where we want to be, right? Um, or I, I don't have a racist bone in my body, all of those usual things, and those really are, um, they're painful, uh, they're uncomfortable, and you know, it did make me, it actually, that, the first thought when I heard about this was, this is not, for, this is not me, this is, I'm not coming to this because the same thing. yeah, this is not my. I don't have a problem with racism. I know racism exists. I'm doing everything that I can to build my daughters up in the best way, knowing that the school's going to be lacking, you know, this additional labor for us at home to make sure that they have uh, the kind of diversity that they understand where they're coming from, their identities, their their Tanzanian Chilean. So. Uh, feeling proud about the skin that they're in, uh, understanding all these cultural stuff, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm cool, right? For, so my first instinct was, well, it's you guys, right? You, you all have to figure this out, not me. 
Um, and so there's like an enormous burden on people of color to sort of guide white people through this discussion, um, which, you know, clearly I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do. I decided, yes, it's important and it needs to, to be done to, to talk, you know, from my, to speak from my perspective. And, but um, I don't know where I'm going here. I, there's no like, real solution. I'll just say that uh, I think Dr. Leah, Leah uh, you mentioned that, you know, looking at yourselves as well, I think, is, is really an important place to start, right? Um, even I, I, I will say, you know, even, even people of color, black people um, that I know, um, and other people of color, uh, have to really, we have to address the internalized racism, right? We all have. Uh, living in a kind of, uh, specifically I'm thinking anti-black society, um, the first thing we have to do is kind of come to terms with the internalized racism that we have within ourselves. Um, so that that's just to say, you know, yes, please, please look at yourselves and, um, but this is awesome, <laughs> um, this is great, and it, it, it's better to start and just try, I think, and just do something, anything, than not do anything because, well, it might be offensive and, well, it might not really work. It's, I think it's better to just get started um, like, we're do like we're doing today. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment from folks? Uh, if not, thank you all very much uh, for helping expand our uh, cultural competency. That's a good term that I wrote down. I like that. Uh, great. At this point, we'll sort of move into a board discussion. You're welcome to stick around for it and, and for the rest of our <coughs> agenda. Um, but thank you. Uh, Mary. Sure. I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Ruth for bringing this um, agenda item up. I think we're peeling off layers and layers of our incompetence and I appreciate the fact that you're being really honest about the role we need to take and I think um, I, I know I'm coming from a place where I have so much to learn. I, as you said, people think they've got it and they, they would say, oh I'm not this, but the examples that you brought up tonight tell me that I'm not ready. I'm not there yet, and I need your help. Or I need the community's help to really to, to get at this. So I appreciate all your, your honesty, your forthrightness, and just because we're in a very white community doesn't mean we all don't need to know this and need to learn because we, we are a global community. And as we send our children out into the world, we want them to be to go out into the community with respect and dignity for everybody, not just to put everybody on an equal terms. I'm not speaking as eloquently as you all have, but I just want to thank you for 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 you know bringing this up for us, and, and thank you, Ruth. I think we do need to uh, really look at this as a as a, an entire community and move forward on it. Yes, oh. Peter. Uh, go sorry, ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just going to make a motion, so um, go ahead. Yeah, I spent four years in Charlottesville, and I think Charlotte's uh, in medical school, and Charlottesville uh, sort of means a lot to me, and yet this particular week relative to what happened there uh, really, I think, in the cultural incompetency is a great term, honestly, or competency if it's a positive term. but. Uh, that I think that sort of expressed where I came from after uh, both what happened in Charlottesville and the response to what happened in Charlottesville by uh, leaders, so be it. Uh, but I think that's a real problem. And I look, you know, and it's the same old thing that we look at ourselves as not being racist or not being biased or, or whatever, that defensive a mode, but the the incompetency is really something every one of us needs to be able to uh, learn. I mean, even learning about the racial symbols and being reading lots of history, all of the statues and all, I never had really the sense 
until I've read a lot over the last week of how bad that is and when they occurred. I've sent them to all my friends because I said, look, this is, did you know this? You know, oh gosh, I really figured this out. So I think this whole incompetency, whether it's historical, whether it's cultural, all those things, we as a school board should be uh, in the forefront, particularly, uh, and I don't know how we do this, because obviously assessing teachers who are the forefront of the way that we as a school board impact on the children that we are educating, uh, how we assess that and condition it, that's a challenge. But to me, that's, that's our main challenge as a school board. We can't solve the problem, but I think to try to, try to talk about it, and it is uncomfortable uh, for sure, uh, to try to talk about it uh, is really going to be important. So uh, thank you, Ruth, for bringing it up. Even though when I first looked at it, I sort of said, oh, God, how are we going to do this? You know, I mean, talk about it. Uh, but as I thought about it more, and uh, all of you have been ex very eloquent, I would say, in the way you've expressed opinions. And I hope John Flowers, who's here, uh, can express that some way in the uh, newspaper if reports it that way because uh, this isn't a divisive issue in a way that we should take it that way. We should take it as a figuring it out how we as humans can live uh, and appreciate everybody in this in the right way. I don't know if it's okay way. if I say something. I'm uh, sure we haven't closed okay. our public comment period yet. Oh, I, I, I wanted to just, I was listening to what you were saying and I think that there are ways that we, as a school board and the community, can um, begin to chisel away at the issue. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying we can't. Anecdotally, I, yeah. I'll tell you a story. I, you know, I got out to Bridgeport. I was all excited to start my new job, and all these little kids ran up to me, and they used to ask me where I was from. So, Philly. <laughs> yeah. and they said, how long did it take you to get here? Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I live in Middlebury, so it didn't take me that long. They were like, no, did you fly here? And I'm like, wait a sec. Because I wasn't really quite clear with, yeah. what do you mean? I, you're not from Africa? I was like, no, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know, the city of brotherly love. And for a long time, until the kids got used to me, they wanted to touch me, which was a little odd. Can we touch you? This gets pretty soft. You can touch me. Right? They wanted to touch my hair. They wanted to know, what are you eating for lunch? Whatever I bought at Charles. But just my presence in the school, and if you look at your teaching staff, can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Because that's a role model that I think many kids of color um, and many kids from diverse backgrounds don't get here at the school. And then one other quick anecdote. I about had a heart attack and three strokes and an aneurysm. And my son Nick, he was in seventh grade, and he came home and he said, Mom, I'm so excited. We're learning about immigration and history. And I'm going to track our, you know, my, our family's immigration history, you know, through Ellis Island. I said, Nick, 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 stop, stop. <laughs> we didn't immigrate. <laughs> there were ships involved. <laughs> There was a long, harrowing journey involved. But we didn't get here the same way that your teacher is teaching you about. Mm -hmm. And then Nick said, well, what am I supposed to do? Because the assignment was to track your history through Ellis Island. So you know, mm -hmm. I got the phone. Mm -hmm. And having to have this discussion with the teacher about, and this is, Caitlin, I'm going to direct this directly to you as director, director of curriculum that when you say like, oh, it's going to be a big task to how are we going to deal with this problem, one way you can do that is systematically looking at the curriculum and how it is being presented to students. Because when my African American son came home and told me that he immigrated through Ellis Island, I said, good grief. I mean, there's multiple t missing teaching moments. You know that big trip in seventh and eighth grade where you go to New York City? Go to Ellis Island. Mm. That's a great field trip. But we go to, the kids go to Rockefeller Center instead. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about immigration? Take them to Ellis Island. Take them to the Statue of Liberty. And that's a curricular change 
that's not that there's already in New York City just tweak the agenda a little bit and systematically begin looking at the curriculum and not only what we teach kids but how we do it. Now I'm going to play into IB because you already have this wonderful vehicle that in theory could help accomplish that goal. And I believe that this is about putting a puzzle together. You have all these different pieces. You may be missing that little corner piece, go get it. But you have pieces already here. It's about how you think about it and truly become, I used to always say this when I taught, but the effective educator is the reflective educator. And truly to be effective if you all begin to reflect on not only who you are, but what you are doing and why you are doing it and how you are doing it, I think several of these questions that are like, how are we going to do this? The answer is here. It's just about wading through to find it. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to um, come back to the term of um, cultural competence and, and just plant a little seed about what is this end game that we're trying to get to here. Um, because I think the term cultural competence, well, it, you know, a, a lot of people use it, but it also can suggest that we're going to follow some sort of program, and at the end of that program, we are going to be certified culturally competent. And that means we don't have to think about this anymore. We're going to have our list of do's and don'ts. We're going to know exactly what terminology to use and exactly what not to say, and we don't have to think about it anymore. We don't have to think about the person that we're dealing with because we know it's a black person, so this is what you say, and this is what you do not say. Um, and uh, I think it's really important that we be really realistic about the fact that that's not going to happen, um, and that we are all going to make racist mistakes, sexist mistakes, homophobic <coughs> mistakes, anti-Semitic mistakes, for the rest of our lives if we're doing what we should be doing, which is trying to learn and trying to reach out and, um, and connect with people and ideas that differ from our own. And there has to be a level of tolerance for um, making those mistakes and, um, and recognizing that this is an ongoing, lifelong process. There's no end to it. And we can all make progress, but we should always be hoping that we're going to have those aha moments until we're done. Um, so, I, I think we just need to be really thoughtful about what it is that we're after and recognize that there's not going to be a graduation um, <laughs> where we have this cultural competence. And, and other people have suggested the term cultural capacity, um, and I'm not quite as familiar or comfortable with that term, but it's intriguing to me um, in that I think it suggests um, an openness and a space for learning and um, and growing, um, but to, to echo the comments of, of um, some of my um, colleagues here, that I, I think the language, it's, it's not just what we teach, it's how we teach it, it's the language that we use, um, which also doesn't mean, oh my god, you said the wrong word, you're going to tumble into the abyss, you know, which I think, that, that's the flip side of doing this work, right, is fearing so much the discomfort and the making mistakes that you choose not to engage at all. And so as you and me move forward, I hope that we're going to be generous in educating each other and, um, and generous in assuming best intentions um, and, uh, and humble in receiving what people have to offer us and staying engaged even through the discomfort. Um, because if we're not having that discomfort, we're, we're not getting anywhere. We're not actually making progress. So we should anticipate lots of mistakes and discomfort, and that will tell us that we are engaged at the level that we should be might be the most important competency of all. Thank you all very much. So I would like to make a motion to uh, move the proposed resolution that is in the document that I sent to all of you. Um, but I'm, do I have somebody, will somebody second it so we can go? I'll second, second it. Second. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> um, so, uh, Part of the resolution is. Uh, Let me share for a second. Yeah, has everybody ahead. had a chance to read it? Has everybody or, or hear it? Would we Would benefit like from, from a reading? Uh, maybe uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. A quick um, so we, the board of Addison Central School District, denounce the actions of Nazis and white supremacists in Charlottesville and other communities throughout our country. 
We support the removal of racist monuments and symbols, including Confederate statutes, statues and flags from public places. In addition, such symbols of racism have no place in our schools and their presence will not be tolerated. We call upon all local, state, and federal officials to denounce Nazism, white supremacy, and racism in all forms. We will create a task force on racism, bias, and discrimination no later than September 15, 2017 to ensure that the Addison Central School District is adequately addressing explicit and implicit bias in all forms in our schools. I have a asterisk to, for below. Given current events and the tendency to avoid discussions of race in Vermont, I've been intentional in the focus on racism. However, the task force may broaden its focus to address homophobia, misogyny, and sexism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of bias or hate, as long as recommendations related to racism remain central to its work. Um, one bit of feedback that I received from someone who couldn't be here today um, asked that I add ableism to the list. Um, so Very good. I would ask if that's OK. Um, and that the task force shall be jointly appointed by the board and the superintendent and shall make recommendations to the board and the superintendent no later than January 15, 2018. Recommendations shall focus on curriculum, training, personnel slash human resources, student support, community education, and other areas in need of improvement. The task force shall be comprised of ACSD faculty, staff, students, and parents, as well as community members with specialized expertise or perspectives. The majority of members must be people of color. So that's the proposed resolution. All right, so we have a move and a second. Um, and it sounds like you want to discuss further. Yeah, so um, in thinking about uh, a board reaction, I know that after the election and some of the incidents that happened in, ha in town, specifically the swastikas that were dr drawn on Havara's door um, and uh, a few other incidents that happened, we had we ma we passed a resolution denouncing those incidences, and talking about how we were an inclusive community and ACSD. Um, I, I meant to look up exactly the wording of that resolution, but so in part this resolution is to affirm the resolution we made before. But um, that resolution was nice and everything, but we didn't do anything beyond it. So I wanted to make sure that this resolution actually had some action-oriented steps after we just said we denounce these things. Um, and I struggled a little bit and talked to people about what could we do. Um, and uh, I, um, I know that there is a lot of good work that's happening. Um, and I know that some of these issues will be addressed with the onset of IB. And um, I was happy to hear that a lot of that's going to actually start this year. So I think that that's really great. Um, but there's more to ACSD than our curriculum. And I wanted to make sure that um, there are issues beyond curriculum that were addressed. Um, so uh, I, I couldn't, I thought that a task force would probably the, be the best way to start at least. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the task force reported back to the board and the superintendent so that we had public, ongoing public discussions on camera in front of the press about this issue and that we did what a lot of you are suggesting. We hold ourselves accountable for this issue and for this conversation and for the results of what we are going to do here tonight um, and make sure that it doesn't just make us feel good that we passed a resolution and that we don't do anything else. So. I want it to be um, publicly reported to the board, and I want something to happen soon, and that we have recommendations that we can act on in our in our school year this year, if possible, but certainly things that we could include in the budget for next year, things that we could create in policy, things that could be implemented as part of um, ACSD, things that could happen as we're hiring new staff and faculty and, um, and, and shifting around our schools under our new um, uh, our new merged school district. There's a lot of opportunity here, and as hard as it may be, I think we have to, have to um, address some of the personnel issues we have with our lack of diversity in personnel. Um, I'm glad, Fernanda, that you're here because as I was racking my brain for do we have any people of color, you are one of two people that I could think of in the district that is not uh, white. Um, and I, there may be more. I don't know all of our staff, but it was really hard for me to come up with anybody um, beyond you and one other member of our teaching staff. 
Um, so uh, I think that that's really not sufficient. Um, so that's why I have these really short turnaround dates, and I don't think it's going to be done on January 15th. I just want us to have some at least initial recommendations for what we can do, and maybe it's an ongoing task force that we have, or maybe it's something else, but that at least we have something quick, um, because this issue is urgent in our country. Our country is being ripped apart, and we're seeing it happen here in our town, and we have to do something, and it has to be now. So that's why I put the dates so quickly. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second and continued discussion. Anybody wish to chime in? Eric? Um, what I've been struggling with since reading your document, Ruth, is um, a preference that I have, which is to use the structures that we've set up over the last two or three years. Uh, we have community engagement groups, we have this, that, and the other thing. And what I worry about with a separate uh, <coughs> structure is it won't be as close or as tight to this group as I'd like it to be. In fact, I wouldn't mind charging us with the responsibility uh, of tackling uh, the challenge that you would, the charge you would give the, the committee that you're recommending. So um, I. I would love to get other ideas about are there ways that we can look at our our vision and mission statement, what we say we're doing, and then how that articulates through our strategic plan and actually deals with a lot of these issues. And, and <coughs> since we first wrote it, um, we've identified IB and several people have talked about it. And I, I just think there are a lot of pieces that we could pull together uh, to make this a stronger stronger thing. Yeah. So I, I, I hear you and I thought about that a lot too, like what do we have already in place that we could build on. Um, my thought about the school board is that we are all white and most of us are, are a little bit older and that we don't have the diversity in our school board to really effectively speak to these issues. And I really feel like we need to have a body that is led by or at least have equal representation by um, members of our community who are, uh, who are people of color. And that we have more than just school board members, that we have faculty and staff, and that we have students involved in it too. I mean, if you talk to students, you're going to get an earful on this issue about what our schools do and don't do. So that is one why I think the, board, the school board is not the right body to tackle it. I did think about the Community Partnership Council, but uh, I could be wrong about this, but I don't believe there are any people of color on the Community Partnership Council. And so we would have to really revamp that to have it a much more diverse group. And that does not report to the board, and that's one of my ongoing frustrations with that as, as it is, is that it doesn't report to the board, so its work is not very public. Um, so, so I hear you and I, I, I respect not creating another committee, but I also feel like we don't have something in place that can effectively deal with it um, and will give it the, the public and high profile and important <coughs> nature that is, is required. Uh, it, I didn't mean only white people would talk about this, just so you're clear. I mean, it's not just this board, but this board having a lot more responsibility mm -hmm. in dealing with us. And I don't see why we can't construct something within the framework that we have. I still don't get that. I mean, I understand your point, but I would prefer to have it tighter to us. It can report to us. We can be responsible for it. Um, I just worry about things getting distant. Further comments? Uh, just to keep the conversation going. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Um, I don't, I, this is a hugely complex issue. And, and we sort of have had 24 hours to think about the right way to go about it. And uh, personally, I would like a lot more time to see different aspects, see what we can use, what we can't use, hear from the administration, and have more of a 
collegial approach than just a, to uh, uh, a task force recommendation. I don't think task forces necessarily change the world. So, you know, I have my doubts about a task force. But I would like time to think about it. Lorraine. Yeah, I, I too am reluctant to just tell Peter, um, we want you to do this task force immediately and we want you to do this by this amount of time. Um, I, I was, when I first saw this, I was like, well, what, what are your thoughts with everything that's been going on? How do you feel we're dealing with things? How we could deal with them better? Um, how does IB work into this? Does it work into this? Um, I'm, I too am reluctant to just <coughs> have a task force and, and I have some time to, it is a very complex issue and a very important issue and so I, I'm hesitant to just do the first thing that is announced to us. And, Further, Suzanne? Um, it is a complex issue. It is something that we all deal with here in the state of Vermont. I mean, I thought I took a cultural comp competency class through UVM, and uh, first words out of our teacher's mouth was, so, what's your, you know, what's your background? And so I mentioned that I'd grown up pretty much in the west, west side of Manchester, which was at that point in time pretty as diverse as you could get in the state of New Hampshire. Um, everyone that lived there was immigrants. My grandmother had come through Ellis Island. But we all learned each other's cultural diversity. We celebrated birthdays together. Um, we hung out together. We respected each other. We knew that sometimes we didn't use the right words, but we we educated each other about what the correct term was or how to talk about different pieces. And that particular teacher said to me when I mentioned that, she says, well, Suzanne, that's nice, but that's not culturally competent. She says, you don't get it. And I said, well, I said, that's, you asked her for our background, and that was mine. Um, my high school was predominantly white, um, but I have taught, I have taught in several districts around the state, and um, I have seen some districts that are so, so closed to anybody that's not white, and other school districts that welcome them, flourish with them. Um, and it's just, it's, it's night and day. And I understand um, your comment about uh, flying into Burlington with your husband. I've flown several times in and out of Burlington, and I've heard people on the plane say, you know, depending on where they're flying, how they're always targeted. And one person actually had found their name on the you know, fly list, but someone else had their same name. And so that they were stuck every time they went to an airport. They had to explain that they were not the person on a new flight list, that they were actually someone else. So it is, it's a really huge issue. Um, I want to make sure we do it right. And I mean, my gut reaction is, yes, we need to do something. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm worried about the task force and how it's going to connect to our curriculum, where that connection is going to be. And if we don't have staff on the committee, then we aren't going to have anybody to know what the curriculum is and what's being taught. So I, I want to make sure that we do it right. I'm not saying not do it, not do it tonight, but make sure we do it right. Cause it, it does affect so many people. Well, let me just, yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. I don't understand why a, uh, a task force would hold us up or, or make things different. Um, 
the time is now. I think if we drag our feet on this, it's going to get diluted with everything else. I, I just want to make sure we have connections to curriculum. I agree, absolutely. And I think a task force can look at that. It can look at lots of different angles, and it's just bringing, doing some of the research and getting some information together so that we can bring it back to the board and then have a discussion in January as, you know, as, as, a, as a date, at least, to, to go for. I just don't want to see it held. The time is now. And I think it's we've got to take we've got to embrace this, and do the best that we can to start gathering resources, information, opinions from people, and just start. And then we can alter it as we need to um, to fit the curriculum or fit whatever we feel we need to do. I think this is a community need. It's not just in the school. It's a community situation, and I think it's ideal to include community members in this and not just school people. So, that's my point. Thank you. Go Unless ahead. Somebody, I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> um, Unless you want to wait for my comments. <laughs> and, and so you can sum up at the end. Would sure, prefer that? go for it. All yeah. right. Uh, if anybody else would like to go. So, uh, you know, I... I Did you want to speak to uh, No, I don't really have anything new to add. I was just going to echo Lorraine's comment about, you know, if I, in the message it had said that Dr. Burroughs had been part of a conversation, so if you wanted to speak about if how you feel like it would align it with the systems that you already have in place, I'd be happy to hear that. Um, and I also, just on a personal note, know how timely of a conversation it is, and with Secretary Holcomb's email or message letter to staff as well, and making sure that the message that teachers and administration are conveying to students is appropriate, is concerning to me because I feel like a lot of us have really strong feelings about what happened and my children are asking about it even though I shield them from news they heard about a confederate flag situation locally and so we had to you know try to bridge that conversation in a way that we didn't insult the people that did it because they might have been doing it out of ignorance I would say I don't know that they were probably doing it to to promote hatred but maybe in the way that some of you have mentioned that it's you know kind of being rebranded as you know freedom of you know anti-government kind of a thing and so trying to bridge that conversation which we did pretty clumsily you know in the car as it came up I would hope that we can help our teachers bridge those conversations in a more structured way with um, hopefully some uh, some prompts to create a conversation that is respectful and not just teachers saying, as uh, Secretary Holcomb had mentioned, what's right and wrong, but enabling the students to have a, a, a healthy conversation about what's happening in the world. Did you want to add anything further? No, I've struggled, as everybody else says, as to the role of the board making up new structures and whatever. I, I, certainly as a compromise, I think there has to be, if there is a task force, there has to be substantial people from the board and others from the community, students, faculty, that would, that would incorporate more than what just board members bring to this discussion, as we've heard already. There's, there's yeah. such a... Complicated, it doesn't do it justice. It's unbelievably complicated. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know where I stand on it. I guess I'm, I think, I don't think we need necessarily more time, as Nick said, but, uh, but, but I think we need, I hate to go out and have a whole new system that comes in and uh, tries to impact something that we're also going to be trying to do through every other way. I be or otherwise. So, would you like to win at this point? Sure. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, Chris, Eaton. me. Yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, I. I uh, you know, I just wanted to chime in. I think that that some of the words I've heard earlier. I mean, I, I think that it's a, a great thing that we're having this conversation. Um, I, I don't want us to be reactive, and I and I think we need to make sure we do act intentionally because of the of, of the discussion and, and what we're talking about. Um, and I don't I, 
I, I, I'm in the same place where I don't know. I mean, I, I think that something needs to be done. Maybe it is a tax force. Maybe it's a chance for us to build on. We've always had a challenge with with engaging the community, and we felt it in in every level. Um, and maybe maybe that's an opportunity for us to to pursue it in a in a different path than a task force. Maybe more in community engagement um, that that is more active and intentional. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend like I know the answer. I I just know that. It's something I feel like we need to get right, and I don't think it's something we need to let, or, or we can let, uh, pass by. But I, it's hard for me to say this is what I want to create at this moment in time without a little more intentionality. Um, that's what I would add. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I would echo what a lot of people shared about their experiences and about how far we have to go. I think it's clear that we've been we've been talking about, I've talked about this with a number of you actually previously and in, in talking about the work that we're doing and trying to do in, in ACSD to to open up this conversation and to begin the dialogue and to start building the kind of culture that we need to establish here to make sure that our kids who are growing up in a really insular, a lot of kids in, in a very insular experience, giving them the opportunity to see something different. I think that was the genesis of IB. That's really the, the drive behind what we're doing with International Baccalaureate is working to give students the ability to think of self and think of other, to, to question what, what they believe, to adhere to the IB mission statement which says, at the end, and I don't know have the language exactly, but to to understand that other people with their unique worldviews are also right, and that is really hard for a lot of kids coming from different community backgrounds and different cultures who have been exposed to a very very narrow view, and we know that with implicit bias, with the biases in general that we carry, with our blind spots that we, we think we see the world in total. And I think as you all shared really eloquently, we don't. We don't see everything we need to see. And we need to have venues where we're able to have these, both have these community conversations, but it also has to get into the system and change the system. And changing institutions is challenging um, our you know so, uh, you mentioned the work at, at the college and and what's happening there and changing institutions takes a lot of time and it takes continued dialogue and continued working together to, to get there and I, I think I hear that echoed from everyone here that we have to act now that this is not something that we can wait for and um, and do in a year or two and I would I would say that we have been acting now, but I think our our national environment has changed to the point where it's changing how we see this work here as well. So I, I think we have we're in some in some ways we're in a place of reacting to what's happening nationally, partly because our kids and our communities are are exposed to the the national reality every day, and are trying to make sense of so what does this mean for us. So it, I think we're at a point of affirmation as well in terms of who we are, what we believe, and, and I agree, Ruth, that it goes beyond a, a resolution to say this is what we believe, but it also comes with action. Um, I guess my sense in terms of, of a next step and moving forward to create this kind of um, environment where we can be hearing from our, our uh, all of our uh, people in our community, especially uh, people of color that are not traditionally part of many of the, the different power structures we have, is to be thoughtful about how can we go about changing that. Um, I, I think that the task force idea is a good one. I think the board also needs some time to, to potentially process how that fits in with the other board roles and potentially with my role. Um, as superintendent, my own goals, uh, my evaluation process, which we're talking about later uh, tonight, 
in, in setting forth which, which part of this work is the board's work, which part of this work is the community work, which part of this work is my work, which I'm tasked by the board to do, and to engage our principals and our, our parents, our community, our students, um, our faculty, everyone in, in moving this work forward. And there is no, I think a few people mentioned, there's no simple solution here. Um, the ability to, be, to, to have a structure in place, and I, and I think the, the resolution has that, you know, a, a structure to begin. I, I, I do think we can't wait a long time to set up a structure to be having these conversations and, and thinking about how they connect to all the other pieces of the organization. Thank you. Uh, my input is, um, I, whenever I have something like this, I'm, I'm always concerned about execution. Uh, I think, you know, I like the, I like the resolution. Um, I think the idea of a task force or something like a task force is a good idea. And I think the wording, which basically says it's to ensure that the district is adequately addressing explicit and implicit bias, it is not saying that we need to be rewriting the curriculum. It's really just to take a, a, a I think that that wording, well, I generally don't like vague wording. I think it actually is, is um, well put together. Uh, and my concern about execution is, um, um, I guess, my preference would be to maybe table this until our meeting on the 21st of September, which uh, sort of violates the, the language of the resolution, which says September 15th. But I, I'm very concerned that that what we don't have as a plan here is to, if we vote on this, um, you know, how do we create a task force? Who's? I, I guess I'd like to see the, the task force idea fleshed out a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm in complete agreement that um, something more than a resolution is in order and that the time is now. Um, and one reason I'd like to sort of put off this conversation a little bit is because at our next meeting is a board training where we're really going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of the superintendent and the board and how the board interacts with the public and, and um, who, you know, who drives something like this. And this is designed to sort of share that. Um, and then, of course, you get it, we can get down into the weeds and talk about if it's a task force that involves people under contract and is there money to pay them and all that. Uh, but rather than, than do that, my preference, I, you know, I'd like to just see the concept fleshed out a little bit so that once we say yes or no, if the answer is yes, what's the next step, day one? What, what are various people's responsibilities to make it happen? And, um, you know, a little bit more about who's going to be driving a task force ship. Uh, and, and get us moving in the right direction because boy it's a big topic that we all would come together on and to uh, it'd be, it'd just to get it focused and, and effective I, is um, I think the biggest challenge um, so those are my feelings I, I, um, I support the resolution I support the language about um, just addressing to make sure that we're adequately addressing explicit and implicit bias um, and I definitely support a more diverse look at this stuff. Um, I just like a little bit more about execution. Please. Okay. Um, <coughs> so I feel like we are letting the uh, sort of how do we do this and structural issues get in the way of the fact that we have an urgent issue that we have not addressed well as a school district, that we have families in, in our community who are being uh, attacked nationally and locally by symbols of hate and racism. And we are not, and we are sitting here talking about how are we going to structure this committee and how is it going to fit in. I, I think that those issues we can figure out. Yeah, we're not going to solve racism with a task force. I'm not suggesting that. But we, we can't twiddle our thumbs and pass something that we feel good about and go home and be like, oh, we're such progressive white people. We need to actually do something. And I haven't heard anything that's a better proposal from anybody at the table. And I, I, you know, you're one of the first people I talked to, Peter, and we talked about the task force. And you were supportive of the idea of a task force. And um, I think that 
it's really important that be led by people who are not the school board and that they are telling us and telling the superintendent what need, you know what they suggest can happen what should happen for our schools that I'm telling you talk to some students at our high school and ask them what goes on at our high school and what doesn't go on at our high school what is not discussed at our high school and and how important that it be discussed as kids are talk are figuring out their own identities and trying to navigate things that are really really challenging for them and so I don't think we have time. I don't know if you guys got a chance to look at the articles that I linked to at the, at the back of my, um, but one of them is titled, The First Thing Teachers Should Do When School Starts is Talk About Hatred in America, and Here's Help. And there's, uh, you know, a link to a lot of resources teachers can use. Another one is, um, there is no apolitical classroom, resources and teaching in these times. And that links to dozens of resources. There are resources out there. There are people who are doing this work and have been doing this work for years and who are deep into it and who can help guide us and our task force. But we can't, we can't not do something because we're a little worried about the logistics of it. I, I, I think that we have so much to learn as a school board and our superintendent and our educational leaders here have so much to learn as educational leaders and we have to set up something something we have to do something so that we can learn something I, I, I struggled with what to do I know this isn't perfect but at least it's something and and I don't want to wait I, 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 I'm, I, I know we have a meeting on the 5th I believe of September is that correct is that when our our um, board, training is. Re board retreat training thing is and then our next meeting is the 18th yeah is that correct so I'd be willing to say that we set it up on the 18th we move the 15th to the 18th and at that meeting I'm happy to work with whoever in the meantime with Peter with Caitlin with whomever and come up with a structure for a task force and membership and come with an actual uh, you know written out task force and and how it would work I, I'm happy to flesh out those details or if you all feel more comfortable with someone else fleshing out those details those details can be fleshed out by the 18th and we can vote on those details now but I really want us to vote on this tonight and to not send people away who came out on a Monday night at the end of summer without us having done something besides passing a nice little um, feel-good resolution we need to actually put something in motion so something happens in our school district and something happens this year in our school district. Because I have 180 days left with my, one of my children too. And she has never, ever had a, a, a discussion outside of one classroom in this building about race. And that's not okay. So we have to do something. And I don't care how uncomfortable it makes us we have to do something. So I really, really, really strongly urge you to get over your discomfort with the logistics or the structure or the membership. Those things can be worked out. Those are a lot easier to figure out than racism. So let's start with something. Here, here. Further, uh... so, go ahead, Chris. I mean, yeah, I just, I mean, the only thing I'd say is that I, I, I agree. I think we need to do something, and I think we should say we're going to do something. Um, but again, I mean, the only issue I have with what Ruth is saying is it's sort of the definition of reactive, it's saying, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to do something, so we're going to do X. And I, I, it, it, if, if, if we move forward and we do this, I'm not going to be upset. I just am going to be worried um, that we might be saying something in motion that is not something that it won't be as, as well figured out as something that if we take a few extra weeks to figure out, we might be able to do our, our first step, our X might be better. Um, that's my only, that's my thought on it. It's sort of the definition of being reactive, doing anything to do something. Mary. I, Chris, I understand what you're saying, but I think if we don't have something to respond to on, say, the 15th or the 18th, whatever day we're coming back, at least let us get started, let some of us get started so that we can 
start thinking about what we would do, present it to the board, and then be more deliberate about the direction we want to go. But to wait another month when the issue was so pertinent now, I mean, this has been festering for years. This is not something new. This is the time for us to, to we've got the uh, energy now, we've got the interest, we've got the country all really primed, and this is a perfect learning opportunity. And I, I just hate to see us wait any longer. Let's just start learning right now. We're going we're to make mistakes but we can always learn from those mistakes. So can, can, we, can we say, can we, and this is just a question, would, it be, would anybody support the idea of editing some of the specifics on how the task force would be jointly appointed or the, what the recommendations shall focus on? I mean, if we, I guess what I'm saying is that if we, if we do something that is written as specific as this is, end up in a place where we we think we, we create something that, that isn't that but is good um, or better um, I don't know it's just, it's just a thought there's some specifics in there that I, I don't know the answer to um, on trying to figure out how to make this happen in, in, a, in, in, in a timely fashion uh, so Chris just to clarify what you're saying is that perhaps uh, removing the language defining how the task force is created might help that out in terms of jointly appointed by. Yeah, I mean, some of the specific, again, yes, this is these are details that seem silly to, to be discussing at a point like this, but um, we're also talking about trying to expect something outside of meeting times um, and there's a lot of specifics in the resolution that may or may not be where we want to be. Um, I don't know. This is tough. I would support Chris. I, that's been one of my thinking on this. Is I the first part of it I, that I think we should do right off. But I think that it's basically the not the addendum, but the final paragraph. I think is fairly uh, descriptive, and in fact, it may be how we go about it. But I, I think it would be, uh, I would feel more comfortable without that in it right now if, in fact, we vote on this tonight and accept it. Yes. So the, the final paragraph um, where the recommendation shall focus on curriculum, training, personnel, human resources, student support, community education, and other areas in need of improvement, that's basically saying that the task force should look at everything in our schools like I don't, I don't know maybe I left off food service I'm not sure what I left mm -hmm. off but facilities. but I, I facilities but you know maybe they maybe that's relevant maybe that actually should be there but I, I guess I, I was trying not to restrict what the the task force would look into so I made it as broad as possible with that yeah. You could say it's the recommendation is that they, uh, Chris, could you please let me finish and then you can have your turn. Sorry, um, that the, Sorry, the task force the should look into everything in our schools um, and comprised of faculty, staff, students, parents, and community members. Did I forget anybody? That's, is there anybody missing there? We, we want everybody involved in this conversation. And so we, we want to make sure it's as broad. So I made this language really broad. The last sentence is just to say that we need to make sure that this is not comprised of the usual people, that this is comprised of people who have personal experience with racism directed against themselves, and that they understand what that feels like, and they understand that there needs to be something done and that white people don't have all the answers. And so I, I really feel like without this last paragraph, I, I, don't, I don't know that this has any teeth and, and that it doesn't have any direction. It's not, it's, not, it's not limiting it. It's in fact making it as broad as possible. And, and I, I guess I'm really just surprised that my colleagues are so afraid of a task force. And that um, there's Ruth, Ruth, oh, hold on, Chris. Hold on. Let me, let me go and, over and here. And that there's a lot of discussion about how a task force might work. <laughs> the task force itself would give us recommendations for what to do. 
this isn't saying what the task force would come up with. I'm not suggesting the answers in the creation of the task force. I'm just suggesting that the task force could work on helping advise us and advise the administration on what to do. Lorraine. First of all, I'm not afraid of a task force. My, my concern is if this had not come up tonight, I'm assuming the administration is not just planning on letting the issue of racism go idly by. Um, did you guys have a conversation once you saw this? I mean, I would like to see our administrators decide how they feel is the best way to approach this, not having the board dictate what we think is the best way to approach it. That's my concern. Um, so that's why I'm not in favor of a task force necessarily. And doing it in such a quick, uh, I do feel it's kind of a major, we need to do something, so let's create a task force. I would prefer to have our administrators come to us with something that they feel is appropriate and see you know, what they have to say. Further board comment? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I said one more. Yeah, one more. One more thing. Um, I, I also am not afraid of a task force. That's, I'd like to chair now. Um, uh, and I, I think kind of like what Lorraine just said, it, it is, it, I think one of the bigger things I, I think that's strange on this and, and maybe is good, maybe isn't, is the jointly acquired by board and superintendent. And, and it's sort of it's one of those areas that we still go back and forth on as a board as to who, who does what. And and it, it seems like it could be done um, more expeditiously if the superintendent was putting it together and the board approved it, maybe. Or uh, I'm not really sure. Um, again, having that specific in there is, uh, you know, if, if it's coming before the board, it still gets its public view and, and it still gets its um, its public input. So, uh, again, I'm not saying I, I, I know the answer, but it might be that particular line. might We might not need that in there um, right now. Uh, this is typically the board's time to debate the issue, but if you have a, a question or something you want to clarify, uh, we'd welcome that. I wanted to clarify something for Chris. But this isn't a knee-jerk reaction. October 3rd, 2015, when the police called me at my house because I had removed a Confederate flag from the parking lot outside, I insisted to the officer that he arrest me at school. You know, because, you know, technically I've taken something. He said, why do you want to be arrested at school? I said, because that is the, the sexiest way to get arrested, mm -hmm. as an act of nonviolent civil disobedience. And so from my perspective, this issue is not a knee-jerk reaction to what happened last week. This has been an ongoing reaction to the realities that my children faced and still face as members of the Addison Central Supervisory District. There are reasons why my daughter no longer rides the bus up Quarry Road, because that bus is a wild trip. And a lot of that is centered around issues of ethnicity and race. The two fights my son has gotten into at Middlebury High School had to do with race. One, the Confederate flag last year, because I took it. I don't know why they were fighting about what I did <laughs> in the locker room, but there was a fight. And that incident, that it was a, there was a racially charged fight mm -hmm. in the locker room, and a child's head was split open. It was not my son. And the football staff of this district said, Nick, go home. Don't worry about it. It never happened. It did happen here. Thank and it's, they're going to continue to happen. Thank you. Would you like to add one, one more clarifying point? You hadn't had it. Uh, I'm speaking to the room next to you. I came late, um, and I'm sorry to speak, um, but I just wanted to add, I know. Uh, I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself and tell us where you're from? Thank you. 
and my son, my sons have ridden the same bus. I just wanted to comment on the same bus and a racial comment that was directed toward one of my sons. Um, a sixth grade girl dropped her hat and out of courtesy, my nine-year-old, now 10-year-old son picked it up and was trying to give it back to her and she said, Ew, don't touch that. Now it's stained with black. Oh, God. And um, he's had a few other racial, racial, racial comments at school um, about the color of his skin, you know, um, comments like refer, referring to it like the color of poo or um, just, you know, like, if you scrub your, I bet if you scrubbed your skin so hard it wouldn't get clean or something, some things like that. And it, it really concerns me and I'm just wondering to what extent um, these children, so young, really understand what they're doing and whether they're actually even getting any education or they're... <coughs> talk to a home or just anywhere. I think talking to students at school, at home, would be one way to address this so that it's a part of the curriculum to talk to students about race, about um, all the things that we're listening here. So that it's not just, we, we cannot just be quiet. Okay, so we've seen what happens when so many things we just let them go, we go through protocol, we go through, you know, um, offices, things never get done. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it just slips by and, and people get hurt. So I, I just, I, I think it's necessary to get something done quickly. And it's hard for people who don't, who are not in this position, not to do anything about it because they're not really affected. They don't understand what the other people face. So I think it's time to just get out of your comfort zones. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, no. but just so you can see the, the, the attention that this needs and the effect it has on both the parents and our community. There's, there's so many other examples, not just directed to my children, but um, other members of my family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, any other board members who would like a second bite of the apple, I think we will. Oh, yes. If the community members that have spoken with such stories feel that this is appropriate, then uh, I'll do whatever you think we should do. Thank you. Um, I, I will um, vote in support of this with the minor change of September 18th. That was really my concern, is that we can get something fleshed out between uh, now and then. Um, I'm hearing a real, I am hearing a real immediacy. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty, it's, this is, this is, this is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough issue, and we are clearly getting out of our comfort zones. Um, so are, just, uh, I, I would just to change, I, I take that as a friendly amendment yes. to take it to the 18th and to add ableism. So sure. Okay. Uh, do you feel confident, Mr. Superintendent, that um, there is time and capacity for you to be part of this conversation between now and the 18th? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, I think okay. we need to get to start school on the specifics about, you know, half by the board, half by the superintendent. I think the, the one thing that is important here is to figure out with the other work that we're doing how does this kind of piece fit in um, I, I think this is a moment as everyone said that we have to capitalize on we can't wait and and wait and and get to a place where we're losing this moment which I think is a powerful moment um, it started probably I mean it started well before 2015 it started long ago and it For me it started in 1968 yeah <laughs> right <laughs> right um so i i think it's a, it's absolutely doable to yeah. to begin thinking about how that's going to fit okay I, I think that we we shouldn't leave tonight without a sense of who you know 
where do, what is the board's work in this and what is my work in this? Because I think that's still not clear in, in terms of the language that we should get clear on what I, I'm where does the where does the board lie? Is this a board directive to me, right. or is this you know where does that where does that fall? I'd, I'd like to um, not decide that tonight. Okay. I'd rather decide that after we have our training and, and on the 18th. Um, but I think that uh, ball rolling is a good first step. Yeah. Personally, I don't know. About it. Yeah. So you feel that this is the appropriate step that you would like to see the board adopt for you to take? I mean, I, I think it's not just me taking. I think it's much broader than that. So well, I would right. say... This is how you feel is the best way to start this process. I mean, I'm, I want I, to be I think, supportive of our I administration. think we have to start somewhere. And I think, as people said, this is a place for us to start. I think as we look at the work that we're doing, I would hope that this group would also be... We'd be looking at the other groups that we have working on these either parallel issues or, you know our community partnership council um, thinking about our partnership teams that we're we're trying to get off the ground or partnership groups at each school um, as our local school boards have gone away we're working to try to get more community engagement and a lot of this work really is in our communities it's not at a high level just at the the district level where we get you know not not lots of community coming and, and being part of board meetings but but in communities and in schools so I think that's another piece that we'd want to be thinking about and talking about as as this took shape. So I, I think with some, you know, making room for some flexibility in terms of, of talking through, this is an initial proposal of what the task force would look like, but it, it's it been, you know, it hasn't really been fleshed out yet by not just the board, but the, by the other people that are involved. And I, I would want to, you know, in terms of, just seeing all the people that care deeply about this to have other people at the table too talking about and thinking through both our leaders, our teachers, our students, the people that are going to comprise the board also maybe thinking about how do we move forward as a group so that we don't establish a group of, of eight people and, and they're off and running without getting that, getting us all together I guess is my thinking. It's not, I, I, nothing's perfect, but I, I think it's, this is, this is important to take a step on and it. And I think the, the, the date is what is, I think, challenging for people is deciding right now, this is exactly what it's going to look like. And so, you know, as, as I think about the district and think about the work that we're doing, I just want to make sure, I think Christina mentioned this earlier, that we're, we're thinking about this work integrated with the other work that we are not just going status quo this year, we are addressing things very differently as we take on IB, as we develop the learner profile, which has this work at its core, um, developing international mindedness, which is at the core of IB, which is really about developing the culture that we're talking about to have these kinds of conversations so it's not a hard thing to talk about in class so that it's not something that we kind of push aside but it's something that we're really confronting together all right we have a motion and a second on the table on the proposed resolution are you ready for the vote if so all all those in all right all those in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. aye. All those opposed? And we have passed the resolution. Thanks, everybody. Now, there's lots more scintillating on the agenda if you'd like to stick around. <laughs> However, we would certainly understand if you took your leave. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, people like to take five, stretch, grab a cookie. To um, meal prices. Oh, shoot. Josh, you ready to talk about it? Josh! Oh, Josh! We could cut this. I hope this is easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. 
No. I can't, I think I went offline, so I can't even open the memo. Well, we talked about this in the finance committee. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the <laughs> thank you, Ruth. So, meal prices are something that, that the boards have all voted every year. Um, next year, we're gonna we'll have to talk about uh, there's, there's a, a tough timing issue where these are all supposed to be voted on prior to things going home. We're sort of beyond that date, but the board doesn't meet in the summer. And so next year, we'll talk about a better timing for all of this. But um, the long story short is for lunch prices, the USDA requires uh, this year, the minimum requirement for lunch price is $2.86 uh, for districts or uh, food service sites that are below that requirement. They have a, a, a tool that you plug in how many meals you had and what the price was, and it spits out uh, basically your the minimum amount that you need to increase your price to move towards that minimum requirement they have. Their minimum requirement goes up every year. Um, and the goal of that is so that the uh, the pay it, so that the federal dollars that are going to your food service program are not subsidizing the full price costs. So for the people who can afford it, they're not getting a subsidy on their meal coming from the USDA. Um, so that's that's the tool that we use. Um, this year, as I said, the minimum was 286, but because we had some schools that were at 270 last year, the the maximum that the USD requires them to go up is 10 cents. Um, and so that's how we got the 280. Uh, you can do plus or minus a few cents to make it a better number, which is how we got report to 27 or 285, I guess is actually the same number. So, um, so that's the lunch. That is a required uh, USDA requirement. Um, the proposed adult lunch, um, the USDA minimum for adult is 375. Uh, Mary Hogan uh, was at $4. Um, I believe last year, and so that's why they're still at $4. Uh, breakfast is not a minimum. There is no minimum for breakfast. The state has been strongly encouraging everyone to be at $2. Um, so I sort of, because most of ours are not at $2, I basically took the, uh, uh, the philosophy of the lunch and that going up 10 cents at a time and, and bumped that one up to get us closer to $2. Uh, and there was no change in the milk price. So. Could you say what uh, breakfast right now for for what? Well, what's the cost? Uh, what, what oh, they're all they're all different. So oh, okay. um, in Weybridge, it's it went from one seventy five to one eighty five, for example. Uh, most of our districts were at a dollar fifty, and they went to a dollar sixty. Uh, Bridport is at two dollars, so I kept them at two dollars. Um, but the board gets to approve and changing these as they as they wish with the exception of those minimums for the lunch price and the minimum for the adult lunch if we were to go below that number we would then have to add funds there's a calculation of how much general fund money we would have to put into our food service system to offset the subsidy from the government how about a motion to approve the uh, meal prices as set I move to Thank you, Suzanne. Second. Thank you, Chip. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Adopted the meal prices. We're now at the report of the superintendent. Excellent. Thank you. So um, part of the transition to a single district was looking at the way I'm providing information to all of you now as one board and thinking about and, and really kind of reflecting on the board communicating, and is this working well to give you all the information you need? And I thought about the board meetings, the local board meetings, and the role that the principal's report played in those meetings, and giving the board a little bit more information about the kind of work that's happening to give you a sense of the pulse in a way. And I think that's, that's important for the board to have an understanding of the kinds of work that we're doing but not to, have, not to have me put 10 different items on the agenda and talk through each one. So the, the design of the board report, which I hope all of you had a chance to read, um, really is kind of looking at the strategic plan and, and the work of the strategic, the strategic plan that we will report on and I will report on every month. Um, also a section on unification and the work we're doing with unification. Um, and a, there's an ACSD schools on the report, which 
um, starting in October, will include uh, a paragraph from principals about some of the work that they're doing in their schools to give you a, a kind of a, just a snapshot of kind of curricular happenings and, and other events, um, other things that are happening. You still have access to the newsletters. Um, remember we talked about that in the spring. So you can um, look at other, um, other schools' newsletters if you want to see what's happening in Salisbury or Shoreham or Weybridge, you can, can go online and do that. Um, the, the focus on that ACSD schools part in the report will be a, kind of a distillation of that, of that newsletter to give a, a sense of kind of board pertinent information. Um, so I am um, open for feedback in terms of if this is the right kind of information. Um, didn't want to overwhelm you with too much information, but did want to give you a sense of all the different kind of cogs and wheels that are happening for us um, month by month as we're looking at meeting the, the, the goals of the strategic plan, um, other goals as set, and um, also giving you information about schools. So that's that was the, the change that I made this year and hoping it's uh, well received. Great questions or comments on that report of the report? Good to look forward to seeing that. Did you say you, you did send one out already, a board report? Yeah, okay. it's part of the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Did, everyone have, did everyone get a chance to, did everyone have access to that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. We can open it. Okay. Did you read it? Oh, so where is it on here? You said it was part of the it's under document. Oh, it's of course. Docs, yeah, so. I didn't go all the way down. Thank you. Okay. Next? Yes, please. Okay. ACSD pre-K development. Thanks here. Um, and Vicki and Caitlin are here as well. And we're going to get the projector going here and talk a little bit about where we are with pre-K and where we are headed. Very good. Thank, Thank you. I thought I was going to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think even if I stood on your shoulders, <laughs> I could do that. If you might get you to be normal. Luckily, two tall guys that can actually reach it. <laughs> it's starting. There you go. So, um, so just to give a quick overview of pre-K in Addison Central School District, we um, I think we've talked about this a couple of times in terms of where we are with our school programs, where we are with our early ed programs, and with our partner programs. And right now, Bridport has a pre-K. It serves ages three to three and four on Mondays and Tuesdays, ages four and five, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They have a capacity of 17 students. We're still waiting to, to see what their final enrollment will be for that program. But their three and four-year-olds are 10 and a half hours each week, and their four and five-year-olds average a little bit more than 20 hours per week. Ripton currently has a four and five-year-old program. They do not serve three-year-olds. Their program, however, is Monday through Thursday an average of 30 hours per week and a capacity of 16. And at this point in time, we have not been up to 16 there. We're waiting to see um, what the capacity is once, um, once all enrollment has, has been completed. In Salisbury, they have a three and four year old program that m runs Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 10 and a half hours a week with a capacity of 15 students. And they also have a four and five year old program that runs Tuesdays and Thursdays and they have a grant to expand their program for um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, where some of the fours and fives overlap with the threes and fours. And that program, if it's expanded, runs for the full school day, and which comes to about 33 and a half hours. Also at Mary Hogan right now, we have our early education program currently at Mary Hogan, which is 
which in essence serves students with disabilities. However, many typically developing students are in that program as well. And right now, the population of the students that we're serving in-house at Mary Hogan are mostly Mary Hogan students. We have had a few over the years of Bridport, Shoreham, Cornwall, Salisbury, but the majority of the students for the last several years have been Middlebury students. Um, so they serve three to five, um, three to five year olds in-house Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. The remainder of their program is outreach. And we are currently um, at 12 to 13 private pre-K providers where their current enrollment um, as of right now is 139 students. So we're serving quite a few more students than we were even three years ago. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Suzanne. Oh, can I ask a question about yep. the, so the, that would be the triple E EEI program? Yes. So just curious. Why has the population shifted so that it's mostly Mary Hogan and not? Because we have pre-Ks that have opened up in some of our other schools and our what we have been pushing is to serve students in their natural environment. So while a student is in Salisbury, if we can support that student in the pre-K in Salisbury, that's what we will do. We have provided students in the Bridport pre-K program with services and supports and as you'll see for next year our intent is to be more in schools and go to where students are versus bringing students in. I yep. just wanted to make sure that it wasn't because parents weren't enrolling students. Yeah, no, no, no. We're serving, um, we're serving a lot of students in other, both in pre-K programs um, that are public um, partners or private partners as well as our public programs. Vicki, I have a question. Yep. Uh, Ripton, 30 hours a week it offers, four days, so clearly that's running longer than the school day? Their, their day is a seven and a half hour day. Okay. So yep, they're the longest school day that we have. That's right. yep. Thank you. Vicki, I have a question. Yep. Is there any hope of um, equalizing the hours? I mean, is it... So what, what a great <laughs> lead in, Mary. <laughs> So, so, um, so we are looking at equalizing the hours. Um, this is what we anticipate for 1819, and what you see here for 18, 1819 is only a partial plan, and I will share why. So, Bridport um, for Bridport, Ripton, and Salisbury, the the age groups that they're serving will not change. We are looking at um, current enrollment patterns and taking a look at our trend of enrollment over the course of three years and taking a look at cost-benefit analysis of ensuring that all students have equitable access. So that's one of the pieces. Also for next year, the Mary Hogan program is going to be run by Mary Hogan. So Tom Buzzle will be the one that oversees the pre-K program at Mary Hogan. We're removing it from our early ed staff because we can increase capacity pretty significantly there. And what we will do is our early ed um, special educators will be providing outreach. So Mary Hogan will become just a pre-K program. And my sense is that they're gonna serve very much the same population that they're serving now. It's just changing leadership versus ownership. So, so at this point, part of what Caitlin and I are doing over the course of the next few months is really making <coughs> look, like I said, at enrollment patterns and looking at cost-benefit analysis of how do we, A, maximize the capacity within the pre-Ks, the public pre-Ks that we currently have, and hopefully increase ours so that we can <coughs> ensure equity across the district. So we're going to be taking a look at that over the course of the next several months. But this is, this is the one step that we've taken so far in terms of next year is shifting the Mary Hogan program. And towns that don't have a pre-K program at their school are welcome to participate if yes. there's space yep. in the other programs. Yep, we have a, I know we have a, um, Cornwall is accessing Salisbury, Shoreham can potentially access Bridport, and yep. I would, just, I would imagine that the, the expanded service at Mary Hogan might be very attractive to a lot yes. of people. Yes, yep. One other question, so when uh, students are going full day, say at Mary Hogan, how, is, how does that compare to the private providers who are also doing the pre-K for them? And, and that's part of what we're taking a look into because full day 
would be school day, and then anything above and beyond would be considered extended day. And we've heard the need for that, and then looking at do we partner with somebody, with, with a Mary Johnson or other, to provide mm -hmm. that? Do we do it in-house? How do we do that so that we're not eight to three or just school day, that there's a possibility, which mm -hmm. doesn't only benefit pre-K students, it can potentially benefit a lot more. And again, it's all kind of that cost-benefit analysis right. of where, where we need to go. What about transportation? For pre-K, um, we do not provide some, well, let me, if a student is going, if they're going to take advantage this year or next year of going to another school, we do not provide that transportation, just as we wouldn't provide a student from East Middlebury going to Mary Johnson. If there are some schools that do provide pre-K transportation on their typical bus runs anyway, or if a student as required by their IEP has transportation, then we would provide it. Is that something that we're, because I know that when my kids were young, it was great because I had a daycare so I could be at home and I could move them from Bridport to Shoreham to Mary Hogan. I could do all that shuttling around but lots of parents don't have that flexibility. So is there a, any thoughts of helping with that in the future? So I mean, part of that is the much larger question around transportation now that we're under one district. Um, and I would invite Meg, if it's OK, with, with the board to, to just answer that question, the transportation from a perspective of the state. OK. So. Um, I'm the pre-K coordinator for this district, um, but also for the other two Addison County districts. And there, um, I went to a presentation that was very interesting from the Barry area. They're looking, they've been doing some transportation. One of the complications <coughs> is when you have, especially three-year-olds, they're so small, they need the, car seats. the, mm -hmm. the car seats. And um, most of the busing uh, companies out there will not accept three-year-olds on their buses full stop. Four-year-olds are a little bit easier to manage, but because so many of these classrooms are three to five, that's, it's complicated. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Caitlin, do you have anything to add? Okay. So now I'm shifting the conversation, so if anybody had other questions about pre-K. Pre-K. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the superintendent's report gave you a very brief update on where we are with international baccalaureate. All nine schools are officially candidate schools at this point, and we are launching into two full years of candidacy, working toward aiming for authorization in 2019. Uh, in the diploma program, what that means is we'll be training teachers to teach specific dipro diploma program courses, in the, and, and that program will roll out um, all at once. The primary years program and the middle years programs are much more incremental. We will learn and implement as we go, building toward full implementation for 2019 when we're authorized. So ultimately, um, we have two years of intense curriculum design ahead of us. And we, um, and, and IB really emphasizes a high level of collaboration, especially at the primary years and middle years levels. So that's pre-K through grades 10. At the, um, at the middle years level, uh, that will be largely subject area collaboration with some interdisciplinary collaboration. That's facilitated by the fact that we have just two buildings that we're working with. So middle school teachers can collaborate within the middle school. High school teachers can collaborate within the high school. And when we come together for in-service, they, they have and will continue to collaborate together. So that's pretty easy to work out. Doing the intensive um, collaboration that's required of the primary years program is more challenging because we're scattered across seven separate campuses. Um, the primary years program is the most, I, uh, from my perspective, from what I understand at this point, I think it's the most highly collaborative um, of the programs. Not only do teachers collaborate on curriculum design at the grade level, but then within a school they collaborate intensively, vertically, to align that curriculum grades pre-K through six in our model. Um, it's, it's a very intense process. 
um, our schools have worked on it to varying degrees and have learned a lot through that process so far. We needed to think about how to take that to scale. So how do we collaborate across schools? Um, and what we have proposed is that, uh, you know, Ripton really can't collaborate at grade level within Ripton. They don't, and which is also true um, of each of our little tiny schools. So Mary Hogan is big enough that there can be grade level teams within it, but our other schools are not big enough. And we didn't, so we had to decide, do we have a single curriculum that we build together for the entire district? Do we have a separate curriculum for each of our schools, or do we do something in between those? And so the model that we've decided to go with is this multi-campus structure. So, um, clicker. <laughs> Does this is this not clicking? Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so starting this fall, teachers and principals will collaborate in, on one of three multi-campus school teams. So Mary Hogan will act alone. Um, Addison Central East will be comprised of Cornwall, Salisbury, and Ripton, and Addison Central West will be Bridport, Shoreham, and Weybridge. I think, is there one more line if you click further? Mm -hmm. So these East-West names are just descriptive. They are, I hope they don't stick. I think it's really important that those school groups come together. <laughs> come together and decide how they want to identify themselves to really start to establish that collaborative culture. Um, they, um, would you click ahead again, please? <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about why we, you can just click right through this slide. Four bullets and stop. Thank you. <laughs> so, so we considered a range of factors in deciding how to organize them. We um, wanted um, to have a variety of um, percentages of FRL represented in schools so, so that we have um, a distributed sense of diversity and wealth across those groups. We wanted our enrollment to be relatively balanced. So if we put all six of our other schools together, they don't equal Mary Hogan. But collaborating across six, just in purely in terms of enrollment, but collaborating across six schools is really hard to do logistically. Getting teachers together, managing that many different schedules, so we needed to go smaller. So these groups are about, based on last year's enrollment, about 210 in one of the groups and about 230 in the other group. Um, we did this sort of geographic divide to limit the travel distance. Even still, it will be challenging for teachers to get to each other to do the level of collaboration that will be required. And so we'll be experimenting with virtual collaboration using Google Hangouts, potentially Skype, to, to host some of our conversations without all of the drive time. Um, and then finally, we have, a, we've, as I've mentioned, some of our schools have gone much further along the process of exploring how to collaborate on curriculum design. Some of our teachers have had extensive training, and others just haven't had that exposure yet. I, this model really balances that level of experience and exposure so that we have confidence and peer leadership on each of those teams. So I'm really excited about the way that we've built these teams. There are a couple of other factors that we didn't successfully balance. Um, the principals identified as being relevant. So they were multi-age classrooms and second languages. So we know that um, multi-age classrooms are a challenge for curriculum, and they're at least as much of a challenge when you're collaborating intensively across grade levels and within schools to how do we decide what gets taught at each grade level when the grade levels are mixed. Um, and we're writing a curriculum together that we're all agreeing to and signing on to. It's a challenge. Um, the only school in our district that has no multi-age classrooms is Mary Hogan. Um, and, then, and then our other schools have di really different structures based on context and history and decisions that have gotten them to where they are. And so we'll be navigating that together. Um, second language is we have... Um, would you click one more, please, Peter? So the majority, so one of the things that principals suggested that we try to balance is enrollment of ELL students. They're a small part of our population, but it's really important, especially as we're embracing diversity and really working on inclusion, that we pay close attention to that small group of students. Um, and so there, w we were interested in balancing and having representation of our ELL and LEP population across these groups. 
Um, we didn't nail the balance there. So the majority of our ELL students at the elementary level are at Mary Hogan, and the second largest group um, is at Bridgeport and Shoreham combined. So we have one of our multi-campus schools that has significantly fewer ELL students. And we really, um, it's, so the factor is out of balance, but we will be paying close attention to that both through our ELL Leadership Council that we established last year and through our careful thinking through of our world language policy and how we understand language as a characteristic of our community going forward. Um, so, is that, oh, that's my that's last it. slide. So um, these groups, as I said, are coming together to collaborate on curriculum design. But before they even, before we break into those groups, the, for the beginning of the year, in August, all seven elementary schools are engaging in two and a half days of formal IB um, training together. Those groups, there are four groups, seven facilitators, and those groups are very mixed. So there are teachers from every school in each group so that we're really still embracing the ACSD connection. And then in October, we will start to learn the process collectively of designing a PYP style, International Baccalaureate style, transdisciplinary unit. And we will create one at each grade level across ACSD. So every grade level across the entire district will build one unit together so that we go through that process of learning together and we collaborate deeply together before we separate into our smaller groups to carry that work forward. So that's, that's really the big curriculum plan for this year at the elementary level. Any questions on how we're tackling this work? Yeah, Mary. How much time is extra time for teachers is this going to be? I, I know you said pre-week, there's gonna be two and a half days. And how much time in October and then monthly? I mean. Yeah, Where so are we building in the time for them? That's a great question, and I have a partial answer for you. Okay. We are spending, um, you know, the two and a half days in pre-week, but that's a formal training. It's not a lot of time to right. actually, it's not time to do formal curriculum writing. Right. We have a day and a half of in-service in October where we are, um, where our primary focus is on building that transdisciplinary unit and learning that process together. And then our hope, what we're aiming for, is that after October, when we, when we break apart to do this small, smaller group work, that we'll be able to find an hour and a half each month for each team, each grade level team, to work with our PYP coordinator, Jessica Lynch, to move that work forward so that when we come back together on early release days, They've made progress and we can do more of that vertical alignment that needs to happen in larger groups. So that's the goal. We have a lot of work to do with the elementary leadership team to determine the logistics of that, to understand where the time is in their schedules, whether that's mm -hmm. meeting time um, that's allowed each month or if it's collaborative time that's built into a day. We mm -hmm. have, um, I think, our design teams and our principals will really be tackling some of those questions this year. Mm -hmm. So their contract this year hasn't changed to add on any additional days or time? No, nope, but we are spending more of our early release time actually writing curriculum together. Okay. And early release is still going to be once a month? It's, it's loosely Roughly. once a month. Roughly. Okay. Other questions? How does language fit into, some schools have got language, others haven't? Is that well, we, I mean, it, it, in this, I, they'll be, the language teachers will be writing curriculum with their colleagues across the district. Um, but that doesn't answer really some schools have language and some schools don't. That's more of a question of um, our world language policy, which we have to develop for the district this year, and our budget cycle in terms of how do we, how do we create positions where positions don't exist. So I haven't tackled that in this curriculum plan because the levers to move it aren't in here yet. It's coming. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. So I also just wanted to add, um, and I sent an invite to all of you um, on Thursday. We've got our kickoff with um, IB, um, our, our partnership with Middlebury College. Back yeah. Uh, and th this partnership has been, uh, I think, a few years in the making. Um, 
part of, part of the partnership is formalizing a lot of the connections we already have. Um, but the center of it has been International Baccalaureate and working with the college to, to, to think about ways that we can partner long term instead of a kind of a one off or we make a strong connection now, but then it kind of fizzles. So it's something that's going to continue. Um, the, the core of that partnership is the professional development school and connecting ed studies and the work they're doing with ACST. So this will have, I, I think, immediate uh, impact for students. Uh, we see mentoring being a part of this. Um, we're going to be leveraging uh, kind of the inter international baccalaureate training and there's a potential of the college looking at, at offering that advanced training or, or regular certificate training to teachers in IB um, along with a lot of other components to, to make the student teacher experience in our schools more meaningful both for the participants at the college but also for our students as well. Do you want to add anything about that, the, the PDS? Or? Um, I, a PDS is the, in the research and in the literature around education is really a phenomenal, very exciting model for close and purposeful collaboration between a university and a school system, typically just a school, but for us a whole district. So um, I'm, I'm just thrilled that this is the, the approach that we're taking. I know it will strengthen, it will strengthen teacher education, but I think it will also really contribute to our professional co learning community as we continue to reflect on our own practice as we pass it along to the next generation of teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, all, all of the details are yet to be sorted out, but the, but the direction is exciting. Um, who is the point person at the college? I mean, the, the thing is signed by Peter and Lori, but who, who is the, who, who's like your counterpart at the college that so would the, be the contact person there? The people we've collaborated with most closely through this process are Tracy Weston and Jonathan Miller Lane, both in the education department at the college. Okay. Um, but that circle needs to expand this year. Yep. We've we've conceptualized it within a small group, and it's it's time to draw more people in. Yeah, and Dave Donnie, who has been a, a lead on facilitating and connecting Tiffany Sargent and, and people from the community engagement office and, and others. So they also see this expanding and part of what we're, we've been working on and talking about is how do we make sure that we manage this so it's not, you know, I take a quarter of it and she takes an eighth of it and everyone's sharing little tiny pieces and it's harder to keep it cohesive and together. So we want to make sure that as we go forward with this, we're not trying to do too much. Um, we're doing what we're doing well and we're really, we have a system in place to be able to oversee it so it's not kind of the, the last thing on someone's list to do because uh, everyone's busy and you know my experience with partnerships is if if those things aren't really clear they don't they don't tend to sustain how about continuing ed credits for the teachers are they going to be getting i think you said certificates is that what you said from the, from middlebury college and the, that would be the teachers at, that would be st t students at middlebury college taking Oh, I see. In Ed Studies, yeah. Okay. So but our teachers, our staff, would they be getting? For the IB training? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Have we figured that out yet in terms so, of how much? Uh, International Baccalaureate actually offers a certificate uh, for teacher education and an advanced certificate for in-service teachers. Middlebury College has not yet decided whether or not they're going to pursue offering that. Um, if if they did, then then yes, our teachers could certainly participate in earning. I think students. she's talking about the training coming up, right? Mm -hmm. The in-service well, training, ongoing training. That's in terms of our collaboration with Middlebury College. Right. So we we don't know how to um, incentivize that and reward participation and really honor the people who step up to to take on leadership roles, both mm -hmm. as mentoring students. So I'm not sure yet, um, but. But I think certificates, credits, I, I think, are on the table for mm -hmm. what, what we need to talk about. Well, it's part of the contract, too. So a, a teacher goes to either a specified workshop or right. takes a course. They get credit to move well, over on the schedule. So that's... Professional development, you, you got a certain number of hours if you did mentoring or if you did uh, more leadership. That, that'll be included in this professional that'll be, development. That'll be, I mean, we're really rethinking what 
what the student teaching experience in the schools looks like. And so we'll certainly be looking at how we've done it in the past, not just starting from scratch and hopefully strengthening those practices. Um, so so I, I also think mentors receive a small stipend. So um, so all of those things are, are yet to be determined. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to report of the board. Um, some of these things are sort of going to keep up on the agenda somewhat repeatedly. Uh, and we'll keep these discussions tonight to a minimum, given the late hour. Now, the superintendent evaluation process, it's the time, um, you know, it, it, this is a good time for us to think about if we were satisfied with the process last year. I know that we discussed at our retreat um, rather than being hit basically with like a week's time to review documents and make a decision in one night that we would like more sort of frequent check-ins on um, how Peter is doing on the goals that he set for himself as well as the policies that we have set forth for him to follow as our goals. Um, and so uh, I guess to keep it quick, I'm going to continue to work on that. Um, but we can have a further discussion about the evaluation process if people are feeling uh, differently about the system that we've used. Uh, since I've been on, on um, a school board and with the ACSU, we've been through many, many iterations of uh, various superintendent evaluations, and it's been a hard sort of nut to crack to come up with the ideal uh, method. Um, this current system that we've been using probably solicited the fewest complaints. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is not a complaint, but it is a recollection from when we went through this process this spring, remembering that a number of people suggested that this next time around we get input from people outside of Peter, because it feels like the evaluation process is just his perspective and then our evaluation of his perspective and That's maybe right. getting another a uh, couple angles on that. Like, let's ask Josh, for example. Don't ask Josh, please. Do not ask Josh. I'd be Thank happy you. to participate. Wow. Exactly. I mean, you, know, you guys talked kind of before this. Or some kind of other way to collect, you know, obviously confidentially, um, but uh, other data for, uh, and, and perspectives. That's right. Yeah. Is this something that we could talk about at the retreat when we're talking about roles and responsibilities and maybe then how to clarify those and to keep touch base with those things? Yeah, frequently? it won't be the time to sort of come up with a new evaluation program, but um, the two definitely um, work together. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, one thing that we were, I think everybody was clear as, with is that we would like it to be more of an ongoing process and not a once a year process. Right. For both. And we're coming up on, we'll be, he and I will be working on ways to make that happen. Maybe daily. Maybe daily. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just tweet. All right. Well, I'll be in your office daily checking in with you. <laughs> you could as you drive through the college. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, Stop and check in. Very, very quickly on board meeting locations. Uh, this is, um, I don't think that, that anybody is feeling like we shouldn't be going out to the smaller schools and, uh, and the, all the schools that are in our area um, as we have. I continue to support that. My only concern is um, uh, inaccessibility of people for having, for meeting out in a distant place. Middlebury centrally located. We've got an excellent audio system here. MCTV can carry it live. Um, those are the pluses. I think the minuses are it keeps us here and nowhere else. And I, I just wanted to get people's feedback to make sure that we're still good with getting out there to the other schools. But as far as I know, MCBT, if those are correct news, is only for Middlebury people. So that right. like Bridport people can't. Actually, it's all it's streamable online. now. Really? If yep. they Anywhere. have good internet service. Yes. Yes. In all of our remote towns. <laughs> <laughs> So I that would be the accessibility, like, right? Going out to other schools, I, you know, politically, I can understand it, okay? Uh, generally, we get no, unless we have a specific issue that draws people to meetings, people are not coming, in most cases, to school board, whether it's small meetings or whether it's big meetings. So I think, you know, realistically, whether that's necessary or not, 
I think there may be some benefits at times to do it, but I don't think there's a good... It puts some pressures on the other schools, too. Obviously, they have somebody there. They have to have it open. They have to have it ready, have to have chairs set up, all those kinds of things which are different than what might be in this. So I just, the practical parts to it. I don't mind driving to Shoreham, but I, well, I don't. It'd be nice to see you in Shoreham once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, it is on the west. I, it's, I, it's I on know, the lake, living in know? Middlebury, I can, I can speak to it uh, with tons of bias that way, obviously. However, I'm just pointing out that there is a practical part to it that I think uh, may not be as easy for the other systems. Peter, were we also uh, talking about if we do go to the outlying schools that there would be some kind of a presentation by possibly a student group? Yes. Uh, we so did, that we, we could, talk about that, you know, so that they could see us. I, I think it's really important for us to see the other schools and to see, see the environment, yeah. possibly meet the students. I think so, too. Oh, and just to add, yes. we, we are starting in October, we're starting a as part of the board meetings of having a one group, one school do a presentation on a specific thing they want to share with the board. Yeah. So I'll, we'll be sending out, Sharon's working on a sign up for principals to sign up and, and pick a month to come in and, and do a presentation with students and, and others from the community. Come into their school? They'll come into a board meeting, wherever that board right. meeting is. So okay. if the decision tonight is, let's continue doing what we did last year and move around, then we would want to align those presentations to when you're in their school. Right. Yes, Ruth? I really like moving around. I think it's important. And I think that um, if we can tie it to learning something new about each of the schools, and it's not just the elementary schools, but moms in the high school too, um, I think it would be really great. And uh, just a note about community members, if you invite them, they will come. You have to invite them. We have to be a board that actually asks the community to come to our meetings. Hearing no objections to uh, continuing to rotate our locations, we'll we'll stick with that policy. Though Any we want to refer to, I want the schools referred to as ACSD West. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that name is going to stick because it was in a PowerPoint. <laughs> Created a monster. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, number four here, uh, talking about the master plan development, again, this is something that uh, we want to just sort of keep on the agenda regularly. Uh, Peter and I kind of talked about, you know, we, uh, within our sixth grade reconfiguration conversations, we talked about starting to work toward a master plan, and it's, it is really driven by the board, and how's that going to happen? And um, one idea is, is, you know, it seems to be somewhat committee-based, but this is clearly something that probably requires a fair bit of community involvement as it progresses, not maybe not right away, or but as it goes, because really the master plan is going to be largely focused on enrollment, facilities, um, and how to make those things align. And we know that those conversations generally require a lot of community engagement. And um, so thought maybe having the um, Community Engagement Committee kind of take on some of the initial steps uh, of the master plan development. That's the thinking there. And we can talk about that uh, further, Jen, as we, as we go. But, but it, it will, I'm sorry. The master plan, like facilities plan? Well, uh, it's really, when we were going through the whole sixth grade reconfiguration, you know, uh, I th what really came out of that was a need to have a plan that's not just looking at one thing in its own, but to really look at our entire um, school system and, you know, from, from what the board sort of is in charge of, that's looking at enrollment, what makes sense in terms of um, facilities, and not have it just be a, a one-year plan or a five-year plan, but really a long-range plan as to where are we headed so that those factors are be, are as well aligned as possible. Could could we wait until after our retreat to or whatever oh, it's oh, being called? No, it's not going to happen until after our okay, retreat. Okay, cuz I, I mean I'm not sure the committee is named appropriately right now. I mean, I think community engagement is something we should all be doing. Right. 
and that committee didn't do any in community engagement last year, or none that ever came to the board. Right. And so, maybe if that if you're tasking this committee with this sort of plan, maybe it's a planning committee or something. So right. Like, no, it, the name doesn't. It was just the um, the sort of available group. Okay. That, well, if we can talk about it after, sure. that would be great. Yep. Unless you want to hash it out tonight. No. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, committee updates. Have any committee updates? Well, then we got through that nice and quick. <laughs> hmm. um, all right, so uh, we have on here executive session. Um, are we? Is that something we're going to need to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going um, to ask for a motion to go into executive session to discuss um, ACSD negotiations pertinent to and under the guise of VSA Title I, Section 313.1b. Motion. Sure. Thanks, Ruth. Second. Nick. Oh, that's Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of going into executive session, please say aye. 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 